Okay, uh, let's go ahead and turn over in our Bibles to Mark 10, and we're going to dive right into the sermon this morning. So this year, we've been looking at how we can live uh, the abundant life, or life to the full, as it's described in chapter 10 of John, uh, but you're going to Mark 10. So I'm just going to reference that so you know for sure that's where it's coming from. John 10.10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came so that we could live life as he intends it to be lived, which is an abundant life. And so this morning, though, I'd like to address what I believe is one of the primary stumbling blocks of living life to the full, okay? If we can figure out how to rid ourselves of this one characteristic, then I do believe that we will be one step closer to living abundantly. And so let's read from God's word here in Mark 10, uh, verse 35. This is the request of James and John. And now as we're reading through this, I'd like to see if you can guess what is the characteristic that I'm thinking of. Verse 35 says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, Jesus, Teacher, they said, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. You just imagine Jesus going, okay, <laughs> all right, okay, uh, what do you want me to do for you? They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup. Uh, I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. You know, I believe that James and John, the sons of thunder, believed that they deserved these seats of honor. If anybody should have them, why not us? I think that it's plausible to say that they considered themselves to be entitled to these seats. And I believe that this feeling, this feeling of entitlement, is one of the primary roadblocks on the path to living the abundant life. Okay, so what is it really? Entitlement. What is it really? Uh, I think I've got a slide here. All right, so this is a smart car, smaller than any other car. And, uh, and you can see he has backed himself into not one, but two spots. What goes through your mind if you're going through the grocery store and parking lot and you see this? Fury? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to wait for the guy. Uh, I don't know. You know, you see this and you go, what is this person thinking? So entitlement, it's definition. It's the condition of having a right to have do or get something. It's the feeling or belief that you deserve to be given something such as a special privilege. A special pri this, this, I, You know, I'm smart enough. Uh, I'm smart enough. I, I, I've got this energy efficient car. Uh, I, I charge that thing up. That, okay, this is, I, I earned this. This is, this is uh, I, des I deserve this. You know, our, our world today tells us that we deserve good things. And I think many of us uh, end up believing this, right? Uh, when bad things happen, what do people ask? Why me? Why did this happen to me? But just think about the implication behind that question. The implication behind that question is that we don't deserve to have bad things happen to us. We deserve good things. And we feel this in an increasing measure if we consider ourselves to be good people. It seems to make sense. Okay, good things ought to happen to good people. That's the way it ought to be. It's interesting, though, that the Bible never really talks about us in ourselves deserving good things. And Jesus certainly never taught his disciples to think this way. So let's just talk about this scene uh, about, you know, with Jesus and the apostles that we just read about. Okay, so the disciples, they're all gathered together. And James and John, sons of thunder... They straight up ask Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we say. Man, how ridiculous is this? Uh, it's funny to me that they didn't just assume that they'd have a seat. That part's already been figured out. 
Uh, but they assumed that the only thing left to be figured out is who's going to sit on the right and who's going to sit on the left. Uh, it, they've already figured out we deserve these seats and we're going to be there. It's just a matter now of who's going to be on the right, who's going to be on the left. But these seats, oh, it's in the bag. They're ours. You know, but aren't, aren't we like this too sometimes? Just stick with me here. Sometimes I feel like I am entitled to a thank you. Right? I feel entitled to a thank you. If I do something for you, the natural response is that you might say to me, thank you. Right? And if that doesn't happen, how do you feel about that? Maybe a little bit, a little bit mad, a little bit messed up. You're like, this, this, this is, I need justice. This is wrong. Right? You feel that way. I expect that food will be served quickly at a fast food restaurant. <laughs> it is in the name. I assume, hey, my order ought to be correct. I paid a whole $1.99 for this. Sometimes I believe that I deserve to be heard. I deserve to be listened to. Because after all, I'm a pretty bright guy, right? My opinions matter. I've got good ideas. Sometimes I feel entitled to my right to go the speed limit and not be hindered by someone in front of me who's going five miles under the speed limit. Like, just move over to the other lane, man. That's what, it, that's what it's there for. Sometimes I feel entitled to recognition for my hard work or respect for my ideas, which are clearly worth listening to. Why wouldn't they be? Sometimes it's a right to protect my feelings. I'm entitled to feel good. And if you do something to me that makes me feel bad, then, at, man, I'm, I'm at least entitled to an apology from you. After all, you made me feel this way. You know, I think that in God's eyes, that all of these sometimes situations, they're, they're ugly every time. Because really, uh, they're proof that I've gotten the false impression that I somehow deserve more than I really deserve. In, in our own eyes, it's not uncommon to believe that we deserve more than we already have. Or at the very least, to desire more than we have and lack the contentment that God desires. You know, but to, the, to the, those on the outside looking in, uh, I think uh, they can see the error of this perspective. Sometimes we're blind to it, but the people all around us, they see it and they say, man, that, that's not right. That's, that's no good. And, and that's kind of what happens here in Mark 10. So go to Mark 10 now, verse uh, 41. And let's just keep on reading. It says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, Jesus uses this situation with James and John as an opportunity to teach about true greatness, okay? Would you really like to just sum up what it means to live a great life in the kingdom of God? Jesus here is saying that we've got to adopt a mindset of servitude and even of slavery and abandon this idea that we deserve to be put first, that we're entitled to a seat of honor. You know, it's, it's funny, uh, go to Matthew 20. So it's funny, in a different account of this same story, James and John's mother is with them, right? In, in the same story, different account, but the mother's there with them. Verse 20 of chapter 20 says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it that you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You know, th there might be people in your life that just think the world of you. You know, they just, they think the world of you. You can do no wrong. And they probably tell you this often. Maybe it's your mom, like, yeah. like James and John. These guys can't go, man, my boys, they deserve a seat at the right and the left in the kingdom of God next to Jesus. So I'm going to go tell them about it, you know. <laughs> you ever been like, mom, mom, stop, mom. Um, 
But the problem is that if we've got people like this in our life, it, oftentimes we can start to believe the things that are said about us. Sometimes with reckless abandon, we assume that these compliments that are made about us are undeniable facts, even if they're far from the truth. Okay, maybe you don't have this, uh, but you still get it from other places. And it's likely, uh, it's likely that you have bought into this at some level in your life. We live in a culture that tells us we deserve it, whatever it is. Here, I want to show you something. So in the 1970s, McDonald's came out with this phrase, right? You, anybody remember this? Yeah. You deserve a break today. Man, I had such a hard day at the office. You know what I deserve? I deserve a Big Mac. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to the McDonald's and I'm going to get me one because you know what? I deserve it. But this, this, it, this plays on our most, uh, uh, I don't know, animalistic desires. It, it, it's all over the place, right? This is a, a bank, right? And so for this bank, uh, if you have an account with them, then you get uh, discounts, uh, discounts at hotels and at restaurants. You probably can't read it. I can't read it either. But the idea at the bottom, it says, extraordinary rewards for extraordinary people. You know what, I, I do deserve the best rooms and a 10% discount on my meal. Why? Well, because I'm extraordinary. <laughs> I deserve it. And it gets bizarre. So check this out. This is, uh, this is for Louisiana produce, and they say, you deserve Louisiana grown. God forbid Georgia grown. That will not do. It must be Louisiana. What in the world could I possibly do to deserve that I would get this kind of produce over something? It's silliness. But this isn't just at, I mean, this, is, this comes in your inbox weekly, right? So I'll show you. This past week, I got these emails. This one was from a, a, a place where I buy textbooks, and it says, you deserve to save a bunch on textbooks. I do? Why? Doesn't make any sense. Next one. You deserve to chill tomorrow. Starbucks sent me that so that I would go and take advantage of their... You know what? I, I do deserve a Frappuccino. <laughs> Next one. And then this one got me right in the heart because it's from my place. Big B Coffee. <laughs> and there's a quote on one of the sleeves from Marilyn Monroe that says, We are all stars. We deserve to twinkle. <laughs> Why do you deserve to twinkle? Okay. Deserve to get that coffee slapped out of your hand if that's in your hand. Okay. This is crazy. Am I crazy or is this crazy? That's crazy. But why is it out there so often? Because it works so often. It sells. People believe this at a deep core level. And it, and it affects how you think about the world. Whether you like it or not, it does affect the way you think about the world. But what do we really deserve? What does the Bible say that we really deserve? It gives us a couple clues. Let's go to Romans 5. This will get heavy for a second, but the point is that there is great joy and contentment if we recognize this scheme of Satan, eliminate it, and live life to the full. You understand? If we, if we recognize the strategy... We can eliminate that and say, nope, I'm not going to live that in that way. I'm going to live in a joyful, content, full way that knocks all this you deserve it stuff out of the way. Check it out. Romans 5, verse 6. It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. But for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here's a question. Uh, when did Christ die? When did Christ die? Not AD 33. <laughs> okay. Uh, and he rose again. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, that's very important. He rose again. Well, okay, but when did he die? Did he die when you were in a position of power for you to coerce him into doing this great deed for you? How about when you became righteous enough to earn his sacrifice? Did it happen when you became good enough? Or when you had proved yourself enough? When you had repented enough? No. At just the right time, while you were still powerless, 
and ungodly and full of sin, that's when Christ died. So no person can boast. This is not something that can be earned. It is not something that can be deserved. And let's continue on. If we haven't earned his sacrifice, well, then what have we earned? Paul doesn't spare us the details, and he tells us exactly. So go to uh, one chapter later, Romans 6, verse 20. It says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you were now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so the wages. Wages are are what you earn for the works that you have done. And Paul here spells it out for us that the wages of our sin is death. So we have earned death because of what we have done. You know, I looked through a lot of passages this week, and I was searching for verses that outline what we as sinful men and women can truthfully and confidently say that we deserve. And this is all that I could come up with. I, this is the only one I looked for a while. This is all that I could find. <laughs> no, now, now, don't get me wrong. There are things that we can expect from God. His mercy is new every morning. He loves us unconditionally. He favors us beyond what we can even comprehend. And yet, none of these things happen because we deserve them. We haven't earned them. We have no right to feel entitled to love, to forgiveness, or even to eternal life. So, how does he really treat us despite the fact that we deserve death? I want to show you how amazing this is that despite the fact that we deserve something like death, he gives us not what we deserve. And that's incredible. It should inspire something within us. Check this out. Psalm 103, verse 8. You can flip there if you want, but I'm moving quickly. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 8, it says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. There's a wage that we've earned, and he said, I'm not going to pay you that wage. That's that's bizarre. Uh, In 2 Corinthians 5, we see this said in the New Testament in kind of a different way. Verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Man, okay, so we deserve death, but he won? He doesn't count our sins against us, and that's incredible. That ought to inspire an amazing amount of action. I mean, that should thrust us forward. We're compelled by the power of the cross to say, wow, I didn't deserve that at all, but yet he did it anyway. So not only, though, does he not count our sins against us, but he gives us this message of reconciliation. He says, you know what, I want you to take your story of receiving something that you didn't deserve and use that story to reconcile other people to me. He gives us the responsibility to go forth into the world and to do that on his behalf. That is the ministry for all believers, new creations. That's not just uh, the ministry of the ministers. That's everybody who's a new creation. Your goal now is to take this ministry of reconciliation and make it a reality in people's lives. That's amazing. Why would he trust us with that? Man. So I, I want to I quickly um, be sure that I'm not being misunderstood. It's, uh, it's a vulnerable thing. You know, I'm, I'm up here and I, I'm giving you very strong statements and guaranteed there's two or three people that are like, man, everything he says, garbage. <laughs> like, I, I, I can't get behind that. 
And I really want to try to not be misunderstood. Uh, Go to Matthew 22. I want to show you this. So this is the greatest commandment and then the second, which is like it. So just, just take a look at this. Okay, verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second, though, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. First, as a quick aside, I think it's totally essential for us to understand this passage in order to live the abundant life. You know, if you're not striving to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength, then living life to the full for you is probably out of reach because you're, you're going about it maybe backwards. But if we do this and we have this on straight, the abundant life is going to come soaring into our life. Now, I know some of you, you do not struggle very much with entitlement. You're like, this is a great message for everybody else. Thank you very much, but this is something that I don't personally struggle with. In a sense, you know, and, and I'm being serious to some extent with this. In a sense, there's some of you that do not believe that you deserve good things. Now, what I mean by that is that there are some of you who are incredibly aware of your flaws. You're very in tune with your shortcomings. And because of this awareness, you can be prone to view yourself negatively. There may be a temptation for you to assign yourself little value and for you to make the conclusion that because you don't deserve anything, you're not worth anything. I want to strongly encourage you to leave that conclusion behind. Because that is not the conclusion we should draw from a message like this. God made you with an incredible amount of value. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He thinks about you as his special possession. He loves you as his very own child, and he wants you to live with him for eternity. We have to understand that embedded into the second greatest commandment, you know, to love your neighbor as yourself, is the implication that self-love and self-care is an inherent need and expectation for believers. The secret, though, is that we must find a healthy balance between these two extremes. The truth is that we don't deserve anything good. Because of sin, we deserve death. However, we've been given a tremendous gift, and God assigns to us more value than we could possibly ever comprehend. What I'm trying to say is that we can get into trouble if we start believing that we deserve gifts from God or that we're entitled to good things. It's no good to punish yourself or to withhold forgiveness or grace or mercy from yourself when it's clear that God wants you to experience the joy that comes from those things. That's life to the full. And Christ died so that you could experience those things. But this all hinges, and I want want to be clear on this, this all hinges on our perception of what we have earned, okay? If you believe that you deserve something, it's it's harder for you to be thankful for it. You know, I, I mean, I just expect at the end of two weeks, the paycheck will be there because I've done the work and it's going to be there. And so I'm thankful for it, but I, I mean, it's supposed to be there, Right? And we all probably feel that way. If it wasn't there, that would be the thing that you get all up in arms about. But if it, I mean, you just don't even think about it. It just comes. It's just there. Okay? But if you believe that you deserve to not have something happen to you, and then it does happen to you, that's often the perfect recipe for anger or confusion or discontent. Right? You believe that you deserved it, and then it didn't happen. What's the result? Anger, discontentment, all these things. All right, let's have some fun. Okay, let's break it down a little bit more. Uh, let's talk about our day today. Uh, Caleb's getting to the point where, like, at dinner time, he'll, he'll, we'll be eating. I'll be like, how was your day today? And he goes, good, and how was your day today? And we'll, like, go back and forth. It's beautiful. Okay, but let's talk about your day. Okay, think about how you got here this morning. I just want us to think about what have we done, what have we really done, to earn the current position and standing that we have in life. 
common, common, uh, common comforts that we maybe enjoy. Just walk through the day with me. Okay, you were sleeping, and then you either woke up naturally, or uh, you were woken up by your alarm, and then you reached over, and for a large percentage of us, you either uh, you grabbed your phone. I'm just, true. You, we want to have honesty time. Who, who, in the very beginning of the morning, you reached over and you, you, you touched your phone within the first five minutes? A lot of us did. Okay, so now within your hand, within your hand, you have more computing power than NASA had to send someone to the moon. In your hand, you have the ability to answer any question that you can conceive of. Who's that guy in that one movie? What else was he in? Boom, you got it. It's there. Okay, and not only that, though, you have the Bible on your phone in 100 languages and in 50 different translations in your language. Okay, cool. We're still in our bed. Okay. <laughs> now, you get out of your bed, and you, 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 you go around the corner, and now you're in the bathroom, okay? And instantaneously, you get the exact water temperature that you want by turning a couple knobs, Right? Uh, you do your business, it flushes out of the way, and you never see it again or think about it again, unless that's your profession, and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, then you go into the kitchen. You make yourself a cup of coffee, something you, maybe you do every morning. And, and so with electricity and water and magic, you have beans that were grown a thousand miles away, that you don't even think about, it's, it's a, a thousand miles away, those beans were grown, and then now they're in your house, and you have a drink that is a basic commodity that billions of people rely on every single day, but it's there, and you don't think about it, it's just always there. You're always going to have it if you want it. <laughs> you, you go outside, you get into your car, your, a, a car, it runs on magical liquid, and takes you wherever you want. The infrastructure, there's roads. That, that literally, you could go from coast to coast on those roads without even thinking about it. And if you ever even sort of get a little bit tiny hungry, you can stop and you have 50 options of places that you could eat. And then you go in and you, and you buy something from one of those places, and a magical chip transfers the money that you've earned to the cashier that then allows you to take your goods with you. Guys, do you... If any of those things go wrong, you get upset because you're like, this should be this way! I just... I want to paint, paint a clear picture for us. We can get incredibly ungrateful and think that we deserve so much more than we really deserve. This isn't so that we would get down on ourselves, but we've got to look at this with a clear set of eyes and be sober about ourselves. We are not entitled to those things. Not to mention the, the time period that you were born in, the country that you were born in, the family that you were born into. You know, I, I really struggle with, man, what if I was born into some other family? I would doubt that I would be a believer, okay? If... Um, if my parents didn't, didn't go to a Bible talk with Tom and Carol Wood and Marietta and then come here and then... Come on. I don't deserve, I don't deserve any of that. I didn't deserve to be born into the family that I was born into and have a perfect example of a parent, my mom and dad. Come on. I don't deserve any of this stuff. Go to, go to James, chapter 1. Where do good things really come from? Where do they really come from? Verse 16. It says, don't be, don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift, it, it comes from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who doesn't change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Every good and perfect gift that you have has come from the Lord. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. So don't, don't be deceived. 
And man, it's so easy to be deceived that we are the source of goodness. If things are going well for you, more often than not, it's likely because you're doing things in God's way in the first place. And it's going well for you because you've decided to submit to His ways. It's not your ways that you've conjured up the perfect way of saving money or how a relationship should work. Anything good that's working out is because it's working out in God's way. When you submit to His ways, then these things all go as they should. Okay, all right. I'm trying to pull it together, guys. So how should we respond to this? Uh, let's go to Proverbs verse 4. Uh, and we're, uh, we're coming in for a close here, but i, I got to hit a couple more of these things. Okay, Proverbs 4. How should we respond? How do we let this affect us? Verse 23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you, everything you do, it flows from it. First and foremost, we should guard our hearts. We need to understand that we don't deserve what God gives us, but He gives it to us anyway. That ought to inspire gratitude within us. You know, expectations uh, in and of themselves, they're not bad. You know, if you keep them modest and you keep them reasonable, it's not wrong to expect that a spouse or a friend should treat you in a certain way. By virtue of the fact that you have a mutually invested in relationship, you rightly should expect certain things from each other. You have to. It's also not wrong to expect that when you pay for a good or a service, you're going to receive something proportionate in exchange. But having these expectations doesn't mean that you're entitled to their fulfillment. And if they are not met, it doesn't justify sinful behavior. If you don't get what you expect, that doesn't mean that you're entitled to be impatient or rude or unkind. You know, once you start practicing the spiritual discipline of gratitude, you'll start to really see that you're never wholly entitled to the material or emotional goods that are produced in even the smallest transaction. Each and every interaction in your life represents an opportunity to really understand that you have never entirely earned or deserved that thing. I think that once we realize that life doesn't owe us anything, everything in life becomes a gift from God. You know, when the checkout guy at the grocery store swipes, you know, uh, uh, swipes and, and bags your groceries, with even an average level of efficiency and friendliness, say, thank you. Thanks for not confronting me with a dead-eyed rudeness when you could have. Thanks for not working at a snail's pace. Thanks for doing your job up to the standard that I expected when so many others don't. Thanks to our ancestors who cleared this land, who set up general stores, which became giant stores, where you work and I shop and where I can buy this bag of coffee that was grown a thousand miles away from here and run it down this little conveyor belt and pay with this handy chip reader machine. Thanks to the forces of the universe that brought us together in this moment for this small exchange in which we both get something we need. Thanks for giving up your time and perhaps a even a little bit of your soul to work this job that helps <laughs> make the world go round. Thank you. Don't say all those things to somebody, but in your mind, think it. <laughs> Once you realize that life doesn't owe you anything, everything in it does become a gift from God. And that, I believe, is really getting at the heart of life to the full. I want to read one more passage, and then we'll, we'll close for this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Okay, here is a trustworthy saying. It deserves full acceptance. That's how he starts off. I love it. Here's a trustworthy saying. It deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom... I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Amen. Now look, Paul understood the weight of his sin, but he also understood that he was shown mercy. He knew that the purpose of his life was to bring God glory by serving as an example of the mercy that was shown to him. My encouragement for us this morning is to guard our hearts and to be grateful. Let's fight against the mindset of entitlement that is just so prevalent in our world. And instead, let's choose to be the servants that God desires living life to the full. Amen.